Hello everybody! For no reason at all I decided to make a video on the history of Ukraine and how it relates to Russia. We will go chronologically, so we'll spend a little time on everything before the year 1800, then talk about the Russian Empire, the USSR, as well as the newly independent Ukraine and the current crisis that makes life hard for it. Naturally, the more recent the time, the longer I will talk about it. So let's get started with the very basics. Ukrainian is an Eastern Slavic language along with the Russian, Belarusian and others. For this reason, for a very long time, Russia and Ukraine were seen as the same thing by the world and by themselves. In case you were wondering, modern Russian and modern Ukrainian are about 75% mutually intelligible. That means about three quarters of the words are similar enough that the speakers could guess what they mean. Ukraine itself has a history sort of like Korea. Korea was invaded and controlled by Russia, Japan and China for centuries because it was a small nation with strong neighbors. The same is true for Ukraine. It was invaded and controlled by the Mongols, then by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, then gained independence in the Cossack era with Russian protection, eventually Austria-Hungary, Prussia and Russia would split Poland and Ukraine along right with it. So some Ukrainians lived under the Austrian and most under the Russian Empire by 1800. If that video idea sounds interesting and you like history or politics with a focus on leftism, that's a great reason to subscribe because I make a video like this every Saturday. Anyways, during the time between 1800 and 1850, Ukraine was slowly integrated into the Russian Empire. The Ukrainians had no nation or own government. Instead, they were split up into provinces and ruled like any other part of Russia, meaning directly by the Tsars. During this period, Ukraine would be called Little Russia or New Russia. People acknowledged the cultural and linguistic differences, but they saw Russia and Ukraine as belonging together. So many of the people who were in the Austrian part of modern day Ukraine tried to get their province to become a part of the Russian Empire next door. For these roughly 100 years for which Ukraine was ruled by Russia, the Ukrainian culture and language were slowly turned to be more in line with Russia. This was because the ruling classes of the regions were all appointed by the Tsar, who was Russian. Eventually, as someone invented nationalism, Ukrainians weren't happy with the subservient position anymore. They wanted to revive their culture and language and tradition. Traditions like this dress or this food. Along with that, more radical ones wanted to have a state for Ukrainians, a nation state, separate from Russia and Austria. Naturally, the Tsarist government didn't see this favorably and feared rebellion, so they just banned people from using or learning the Ukrainian language, which is cultural genocide. You know, there are people who think that the Tsar was a great ruler and that we should establish monarchy again. They clearly don't know the history of any minority in any kingdom or empire, because if they did, they would hate monarchy as much as I do. When the Industrial Revolution happened, it was very slow to start in Russia. You probably know that it only really got going under the USSR, but there were some factories and some mines. At the start, mostly in Ukraine. These cities and factories were under strong Russian cultural control, while those working on farming in the rest of the land remained culturally and ethnically Ukrainian. During this period, since Ukraine was a part of Russia, the Ukrainian population groups moved. Notably, they settled in the Donbass, which is today a part of eastern Ukraine at time of recording. And some settled in Crimea. What was and was not Ukrainian at this time was messy and confusing. There were provinces, but many of them had different ethnicities in different parts of the province. So it would be impossible to judge what was part of Ukraine at this time. Eventually, in 1914, Serbia dragged Russia into World War I, which dragged Ukraine with it. Now the Ukrainians in Austria and the ones in Russia found themselves on different sides of the war. Both sides conscripted Ukrainians to fight each other. Ukraine was basically a pawn in between the big European empires. This fact would split Ukraine and even long after the war ended, there would be revenge killings against those who fought on the other side rather than the other. At the start of the war, Russia quickly took Galicia and held it for most of the war. With that, all the Ukrainian speakers were not part of Russia. Ukrainian leaders in Russia were very worried that the war 
would give the Tsar power to brutally repress the Ukrainian independence movement. And they were correct. Especially in Galicia, but all over Ukraine, there were pogroms against pro-independence politicians and authors. Some more moderate thought leaders suggested that the Russian Empire become a federal republic so Ukraine can have its own government and some autonomy, uh, but the Tsar of course didn't even consider that. The Tsar was an incompetent ruler and after three years of war there were popular uprisings against the Russian Empire. Minority cultures like Belarusian and Ukrainians were marching with the peasants of Russia to fight for their rights. So in February of 1917, the February Revolution, abolished the Tsar and set up a Duma to rule the new Russian Republic. Upon seeing this Liberal Party taking power, the leaders in Ukraine decided that this is their moment and they declared independence. The border they wanted was this one. Curiously, not including Galicia, but instead parts of the Western Caucasus and Crimea, which by this time had majority Russian population, and I was not able to find an explanation of why they thought this should be theirs, besides 500-year-old countries. Notably, there is this postcard from 1919, which includes half of Russia as Ukraine. This is kind of ridiculous, but look at these borders. It would include Stalingrad, the Caucasus and half of Poland. When hearing that the Ukrainians declared independence, the Russian government did nothing. They were still in an all-encompassing war against Germany and Austria, so they had bigger priorities. While Ukraine was declared independent, nobody recognized it and they didn't really have an army to defend themselves. So when the Russian army kept fighting on Ukrainian land, there wasn't much anyone could do to stop that. Eventually, the February Revolutionary Government was overthrown in the Bolshevik October Revolution, which immediately sparked a civil war between troops loyal to the Tsar and those who were loyal to Lenin and his friends. At the same time, Russia was still being invaded, so discussing Ukrainian independence was not anyone's priority. Eventually, the new government was pushed back by the German Empire and had to draw a ceasefire line here which notably gives most of Ukraine to Austria and German occupation. When Austria and Germany lost the war, the region was practically anarchy. Russia was in the civil war, so there was no centralized rule in the region. During this period, lots of local governments declared themselves the rulers of Ukraine, namely the Free Territory, which I have a whole video on, the Ukrainian People's Republic, which wanted to be part of Soviet Russia, the Ukrainian state that wanted anything but communist rule, and way more smaller movements. When Germany surrendered in 1918, the Allies went about redrawing the map of Europe, creating new states like Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland and more. And because at the time of the surrender, Germany occupied Ukraine, they decided to draw a new map there too. They declared lots of formerly German occupied regions to be the new Ukrainian state. Part of the idea was to create a buffer state between the West and the scary Bolsheviks. But of course, the Bolshevik government didn't recognize this treaty at all. So, when the civil war was nearing its end, the Red Army marched into Ukraine and declared it the new Soviet Republic, independent from the Russian Soviet Federative Republic. These two, along with the Belarusian Socialist Republic, would eventually sign the Treaty for the Creation of the USSR to form one socialist state. What makes them different from the Tsarist Empire was the structure of the government. I have a whole video on the way the USSR worked, but basically it was a federal state. So people in Ukraine would have their local elected government that decides on all domestic politics like industry, city planning, roads, electrification and so on. And this government was subservient to the central government in Moscow, which worked on things like military, defense and broad economic goals. You can imagine it like the USA with Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, all being states under the federal Soviet government. This was meant to ensure that minorities aren't ignored in the lawmaking process as it was under the empire for a literal century. Immediately after the Russian Civil War, there was the famine from 1921 to 1922. Essentially, a lot of crops failed for the year and Lenin managed to get international aid to reduce the suffering of the local population. As you would expect, I have a whole video on just this one famine. With new autonomy and freedoms being given to Ukrainian language and culture, under the Bolshevik government there was a renaissance after the century of suppression.
and the Ukrainian Republic had multiple smaller regions controlled by other ethnicities, like Russians and Germans as well. So this was not some nationalist period, but more of a socialist one with solidarity among peoples. When teaching was done in Ukrainian again, the massive amounts of people in the rural areas learned to read and they moved to the cities, making places like Kiev mostly Ukrainian. But of course, as Ukraine and Russia were the same nation, there were still plenty of ethnic and linguistic Russians over there. But despite this, the ruling party members of Ukraine were mostly Ukrainians, speaking Ukrainian, not Russians, so it was not an occupation, even if Ukrainian nationalists may disagree with me. During Stalin's first five-year plan, Ukraine was massively changed from mostly agrarian towards industrial. It was a huge social change and Stalin's policies weren't exactly flawless. The rapid industrialization brought the famine with it. This famine is called the Holodomor. It took place in 1932 and it describes an event in which Ukraine and parts of Russia were unable to supply enough food for the people. I have a whole video on it if you're interested, but very basically, industrialization plus a drought caused shortages and Stalin, unlike Lenin, would not admit weakness to the international community, so no aid was coming, making the Holodomor one of the deadliest famines in modern history. Shortly later, the Second World War came to Russia and Ukraine was once again on the front line between Russia and Germany. Ukraine spent much of the war under Nazi occupation. Partisans rose up to defend their lands against the German invaders, and in return the Germans executed millions of civilians in reprisals. Over a million Ukrainian people died just in the Holocaust. When the Soviets had retreated, they took all the industry with them, and when the Germans took over, they burned their houses, and when the Germans retreated, they leveled the cities. Ukraine, along with Belarus and the Baltic states, suffered most under the brutal Nazi invasion. In total, Ukraine lost 10% of its population in these years. After World War II, Ukraine got some extra rights, so they could engage in international diplomacy, to some extent, which enabled the Ukrainian Socialist Republic to become a founding member of the UN. During the Cold War, Ukraine and Russia were very close. They cooperated in everything, from military to industry, and standards of living and individual rights were the same across the borders. I would argue that it is fair to say that Ukraine was not suppressed or disadvantaged when part of the USSR, especially not after they reformed to a two-chamber democratic government. Because Russia and Ukraine were so close, the border between them barely mattered. There was free travel, so no border checks anyways. The administrative border was kind of arbitrary and did not properly consider ethnic lines. So a bunch of Russians who lived in the Donbass region were given to Ukraine. And in 1954, Crimea was given to be administered by Ukraine instead of Russia. The reason is quite a mystery to me because Crimea was 70% Russians at the time. But it was probably only intended as an administrative division, not to be used as a border or anything. It's like how there are Austrians in South Tyrol in Italy. The border is open, the countries are friendly, and we have one currency. There is no good reason to change the border. And because of similar philosophy, the borders of the USSR's member states often changed during the Cold War for local reasons. For the Cold War, Ukraine was an integral part to the Soviet defense. As a matter of fact, they stored 2,000 nukes on their land, though those were controlled and maintained by the Red Army, which was not accountable to the Ukrainian government, but only the Soviet one. Aside from Chernobyl in 1986, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic lived a calm life until the collapse came in 1991. By this time, a lot of the Soviet Union had changed. Corruption and stagnation made lives of the people feel worse. The state had little interest in technological progress and the people were generally up unhappy. So in 1991, the Soviet Union was dissolved and the member states became independents. Naturally, it's more complicated than that. There is a 45 minute video on it on my channel. So by 1991, Ukraine was independent with the borders it had during the times of the Soviet Union including some majority Russian speakers who were now a minority in the Ukrainian national state. Ukraine went about doing what they could do and sent Soviet nuclear missiles back to Russia, expelled the Red Army and held free elections. They immediately elected a former Communist Party member as president and a few years later he was replaced with another former Communist Party member. As you can tell, the Ukrainian people weren't as anti-communist as they're now. 
The post-communist time was rough in Ukraine. In a previous video, I talked about how the collapse of the USSR made life worse in the former member states, and Ukraine is a good example to look at. Unemployment was up because of privatization, healthcare got worse to save money, which dropped the life expectancy, people were getting poorer so they had fewer children, alcohol and drug use went through the roof, and so much more. Unemployment is still nowhere near as low as it was under communist times, and neither are birth rates or life expectancy. Ukraine was and is still suffering from the collapse of the USSR. It's no surprise that 75% of Ukrainians said that their lives were better under communism, almost as if a socialist economy increases individual prosperity compared to a profit-driven one. The second former communist president, would rule until 2004 and only have one major scandal when it came known that he sent weapons to Saddam Hussein and wanted a journalist executed. He was not re-elected. These two presidents I talked about sought really close ties to Russia and to other former states, but in the next election the people were faced with the choice of another Russia fan or a president who would move closer to NATO and the EU. Because of frustration with the still stagnant economy, they voted for the second one. Pretty much every Ukrainian leader since then had chaotic moments, instable ruling scandals, sometimes they were even arrested and thrown into prison because of what they did when they were in office. They even messed with the constitution. Effectively, Ukraine was barely democratic. So, in 2014, there was a revolution. This ended with the old ruler fleeing the country and a new president named Petro Prokoshenko being elected. He undid all the bad changes in the constitution. He wasn't even a communist party member. He was a businessman, so that's a different direction to take. He would rule until 2019. His goal was to get closer to the West, NATO and the EU, which naturally President Putin of Russia did not like to see. Remember that revolution thing? That matters now. During the chaos and the de facto lack of Ukrainian government, the Russian army sent troops into Crimea because the province had declared itself independence in the chaos. Russia then supported a referendum, and the people of Crimea overwhelmingly voted to become a part of Russia. This makes complete sense. After all, Crimea is inhabited by Russian speakers, who make up 80% of the population there. Now, there is this moral question if this was a good thing, Technically speaking, it makes sense that Russians would live in Russia, not Ukraine, especially when Ukraine is getting more and more distance from Russia. Not to mention, the peninsula belonged to Russia for centuries and was only given to Ukraine for internal reason and not as part of a nation state. They did not redraw the maps when Ukraine declared independence, like they got to keep all the regions, even the majority Russian ones. But on the other side, of course, you can't just invade a country because you're unhappy with your border. If you could, all of Africa would be in flames. During the revolutionary chaos, the two regions in the Donbas, that have majority Russian people, rose up in rebellion against the government in Kiev. They declared themselves independence, and according to the rebels themselves, 90% of the people there wanted to be independent from Ukraine. This is a bit hard to believe, as only 80% of the people there speak Russian, and only 35% are ethnically Russians. They spent years fighting off the Ukrainian military, shooting down bombers and such, and once they even accidentally shot down a civilian airliner, which is a severely bad move. Over the next years, Ukraine moved closer and closer towards joining NATO, all while refusing to find a solution to the rebellion in the Donbass. If you think about it, it's just like the rest of Ukrainian history. They're a pawn in the power place between NATO and Russia, just as they were between Russia and Austria, or under the Commonwealth. These poor people can just never get a break, it seems. Curiously enough, since 2014, Putin tried to negotiate on behalf of the pro-Russian separatists many times, but the Ukrainian government either refused to meet or refused to make any compromises. Ukraine, at the time of recording, does not only consider the Donbass to be their territory, but they also still consider Crimea their territory. So, in early 2022, Russia collected troops on the border of Ukraine. Personally, I expected a repeat of the annexation of Crimea, Russians marching into the disputed territory, holding a referendum and annexing it. This is not what happened. Instead, Russia started a modern form of warfare. Missiles were hitting all over the country on all airfields and military installations, and then the troops marched into Ukraine. At time of recording, they're outside of Kiev, but undoubtedly by the time this video is out on Saturday, things may already be entirely different. 
Personally, my guess is that Putin started the invasion to pressure Ukraine to acknowledge the Russian ownership of the Donbass and Crimea. To me, this war is pointless and could have been avoided if at any time between 2014 and 2022 the diplomats of both sides had met and worked out a compromise. I know people from Russia and from Ukraine and they all agree with me that this war is for the egos of men at the top, not the wishes of the people. My heart goes out to all those who will inevitably lose freedoms, health and life in this conflict. There are great arguments about who is in the right, Ukraine or Russia, and I don't need to give my opinion here, I have a video about that as well. The situation is complex and has been in the making since the times of the Russian Empire. Now that you have all this information, which I hope I covered neutrally, you should be able to make your own judgments now. Side note, there are arguments that the Ukrainian government is fascist and Putin is liberating the Ukrainian people, but I found literally not a hint of evidence to understand what they mean. Feel free to correct me in the comments, but to me the Ukrainian president seems like a stone-hard liberal with introducing abortion rights and medical drugs. He did do bad stuff, but nothing that Putin didn't do himself, so it's a weird thing to accuse him of fascism. Thank you for watching. This one is definitely demonetized now, but I figured it's an important video to make, since many people ask me to explain the context in which this war is happening. I hope I was able to deliver what you expected. Interestingly, this video is the third demonetized one among my last four uploads. This means YouTube only pays me 25% of what I made last month. So why not help a small poor YouTube channel and give me money on Patreon? Uh, you'd get to join the Discord server or have your name read out a bit like this. Special thanks to Hemuding, Tion Hartley, Potato God 777, Alan Vo, Darius the Bird, Eric Betts, Harris Hawk, Marcus Aurelia, V. Xander Corvus, Attila Nemetz, Carissa, Conrad Falcon, Daniel Hyman, Dominic Cusanelli, DSM 5 is better than ICD 10, Emily Margot Klassen, Evie Wren, Herdina, Ian Snyder, Josh C. Glastrup, Liam S., Lilith Craft, Memuka Ciliari, Marxism Tonight, Nane Pema, Pote, Raman Deville, Red Shock Trooper, Sean Murphy, Stemmaster Chef, Theon Gilliard Jr., and Tra